okay, so page 64, here we go. City council. You should know that the city council is the legislative body of a city that sets policies. Uh, they pass laws and they do things like that. Okay, and they work closely with the mayor of that city, okay? Next, we have the Village Board of Trustees. It's the equivalent of a city council, but it's at the village level. So when we were talking a few moments ago about all the different layers in government, it gets expensive. You know, you got salaries, you've got to have, you know, people that are accommodating, coordinating, and it's just, all this stuff is all, it, it just, it's unnecessary. You know, you go to other states outside of New York and it's shocking, it's, uh, it's shocking how, few layers of government there are in other states, particularly as you head south or southwest. For some reason, the northeast is just bogged down with tons and tons of government. Um, next on page 64, planning board. Make sure you read through that. Zoning board of appeals. You've heard us talk about that in earlier chapters. They hear and decide any requests for variances and special use permits that are submitted. So I just wanna make sure I feel like when we did our trigger words review, I want to make sure that um, that you know the trigger word for variance. So think a moment about what would be a key trigger word to know with a variance. We know that if you can't get a variance, you should apply for a special use permit. We've covered that pretty well the last couple times we were together. But there's a word that starts with an H that's a trigger word for variance. You can't ask the question without this word that starts with an H. Yes, Gino, you've got it. Hardship. That's your trigger word when you talk about, so if you see hardship in a question and variance is an option, like that's, you wanna, that's gonna be the right answer. I guarantee you that's the right answer. And how great is that, that you have a flashcard, one side says variance, the answer, and one side says hardship. Done. Now you move on. Of course, if, if, you're, if you're holding a real estate seminar and someone says to you, well, what's a variance? So why don't I just get a special use permit? Of course, you're going to know all of that. I hope you will. We've talked about that. We'll talk about it again when we loop around in the program. Uh, next, we talk about the Architectural Review Board. The Architectural Review Board. So they determine the effects of a proposed building, alteration requests, or other related items, and how it will affect the desirability, property value, and surrounding neighborhood. Now, in certain parts of Buffalo and city of Rochester, and in certain parts of Chautauqua County and elsewhere, the Architectural Review Board, they're busy. And the Historic Preservation Office, they, they usually abbreviated HPO, the Historic Preservation Office, they identify, evaluate, and their, their aim is to preserve. Now, it turns out preserve is your trigger word. When you're talking about, well, preservation and preserve, you have to have that in the question. And that's usually an easy one if you remember what I'm telling you right now. So if the question has something about preserve, it'll talk about preserve, the architectural nature, blah, 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 of whatever, then the answer you're going to pick is the Historic Preservation Office. Just another little clue. You just never know what you're going to see on the state exam. Again, they mix everything up. 3,500 questions is the base that the state's working with, and they just pull. They have to pull so many from this category, so many from that category. So, uh, yeah. So building departments, the next one. Of course, the building department is that department that you go and get building permits from. Of course, read through the definition. But building permits, when you're going to uh, do any work to your property. If you're going to put new windows in, if you're going to put a deck on, you know, sometimes decks and patios, uh, if it's not it, like, well, both of them, for example, some communities don't require a building permit if it's not touching the house. So that's why if you ever go up to a house and you see that there's an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch between the deck and the, and the house, it's because they didn't want to get a building permit and deal with you know, it's something else to pay for. Then it's another inspection to get. And then, of course, it'll probably raise your assessment as well. Okay. So, again, you have to check. Every town is different. I know Clarence was a certain way. I know Town of Tonawanda was a certain way. So, and that's always subject to change. All right. You have the receiver of taxes next. Obviously, it's not too difficult. Then you have the Wetland Commission at the bottom of page 64. The Wetland Commission 
also known as the Conservation Advisory Council. It monitors wetlands in the local uh, at the local level and even through the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. So give the rest of that a read through. The most common state exam question that you're going to see is the question will ask you about something with wetlands and what governmental agencies will you deal with if there's wetlands at the property. The 12.4 acre thing is something we're telling you they're rarely, rarely asked. If you get that, you probably have an awful exam that month. Dealing with wetlands, the options you want to pick is the Army Corps of Engineers and the DEC. So either of those options that show up are what you're going to want to look for as the correct answer if the question says which governmental agencies deal with wetlands. You want to pick Army Corps of Engineers or the DEC. There's a New York State DEC, Department of Environmental Conservation, and there's a federal DEC as well. Page 65, you have the engineer's office. Making engineering changes, like if you're like subdivision, if you're, if you're, if you're dealing with a builder who's setting up a new subdivision, hopefully you remember the subdivision development. What's that body of laws? Anybody remember? Subdivision development, you should think of article what? You never know when I'm going to ask a question, okay? That's the excitement I bring to the course tonight. Almost nights I try. Article what is the main body of laws for subdivision and development? Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Gino. It got eerily quiet for a moment. So, yes, so Article 9A, that's subdivision and development, okay? Now, when you're setting up a subdivision, you deal a lot with the engineer's office, you know, and it's and it's – Usually not you, but you might run things around and pick things up and whatever. And they make lots of inspections because, you know, when you're setting up subdivision, you're putting in roads, you're putting in curbs, you're running the infrastructure. Does any here, here's something out of the blue? Because, you know, again, you never know when I'm going to ask a question. Do you know what the term is that refers to when the builder turns over the public parts of that subdivision to the municipality? What do we call that term? It starts with a D. When we turn that subdivision over to the municipality so that they maintain this, the sidewalks and the curbs and the streets and all that good stuff. Good job. Dedication is correct. Dedication is the process of doing what I just said. Turning over the infrastructure, the streets, the curbs, all that good stuff to the municipality. Great. Good job. Know that for test purposes. I believe it's on the school exam as well, but you definitely, the, it's short, the state exam always asks that question. Okay? Page 65 continues with the county health department. Make sure you read through that on your own, but the county health department, the most typical question that you see on the state exam with the county health department is they'll say something along the lines of, if there's a septic and a well at the property that you're selling, which of the following departments would most likely be involved in the approval process for inspections and things like that? That's your answer, the county health department. Definitely worth knowing. In the context that I just shared with you is the most common way you'll see that presented, okay? So the, the, you will spend some time with at municipal offices as a real estate professional, not only just, you know, I know I emphasize the fact that as a um, working with builders and new construction, you spend a lot more time there, but you also will go there to look up other things too, you know, and confirm that maybe uh, you want to, maybe you want to check out and see if something was done according to code. You don't have to do this. Some people, they go above and beyond, you know. The average real estate agent, believe me, just does the bare minimum. They don't want to have to do anything more. But it's it's nice because sometimes, like let's say let's say you have a property. Okay, I'll give you a good good example. So in the town of Tonawanda, there's some people that their home has been there for generations. You know, it's the, the mom and the dad, and they got older, then they gave it to the kids when they passed on, and the kids, and they raised a the family. That's a bunch of years that that's possible that you can live in a home. Let's say in Tonawanda, and in the interim the municipality passed a law that said that you need to have, you need to have a sump pump. Now there's never been a, this house that I'm talking about for in, in my example, there's never been a problem with water coming into the basement. 
Okay. And all the neighbors, you know, they've got some pumps because that's the law, right? You can't transfer a property without showing that you've got a sump pump there. And it has to be tested every time you sell the property. Somebody from the building department, that's the last thing we talked, one of the last things we talked about here. Uh, the building department, someone has to come out and check and make sure that not only does it work, but it's on a separate line. It can't be like you can't have everything else plugged into it. It's got to be a separate dedicated line and that it actually does the job and discharges the water properly. You know, So you might be the real estate agent that has to give the bad news to the um, to the homeowner, you know, and he's like, last time I had to do that, the homeowner was a nice little old lady, 80 years old. And she looked at me like I had three heads when I said, we have to have somebody come out and crack a hole, crack a hole into your basement and put a sump pump, you know, your basement that's never leaked before and put in a sump pump to meet the requirements of the municipality where you're not going to be able to sell your home. But, you know, having someone spend $8,000 to put something in their basement for something is not a problem. You know, and I, like that basement that I'm talking about was super dry. It was tight. It was, wow, it was heartbreaking to think that they had to do this. You know, it's one thing if it's a wet basement and it's like if it's a hot mess of a house. Okay, this like you really should have done this years ago. You're lucky you don't have structural problems as a result of a lack of a sump pump. But when everything's great and you're saying, oh, no, you still got to spend all this money, you know, it's just it's awful. But that's something you're going to have to do from time to time. You know, as years go on, it's become less and less. But there's still a few out there. And hopefully I didn't jinx any of you that this will happen to you right away. But, um, yeah, so we need to know this because, remember, we're um, we're the main source of information for people in the real estate field. You know, when people come to us, they're expecting that you know these things or know where to get answers for these things. Okay, uh, at the bottom of page 65, we talk about city council and village board of trustees. I'm happy to tell you, you don't need to know the different terms and how many people serve on there. Know that they exist and know, uh, know how they compare to, if you're at a village, it's a village board of trustees. If it's a, at a, an urban or city level, then it's a city council, okay? Next page, 66. A lot of information about Buffalo in particular. It's a major city in Western New York. So we kind of address that. You don't need to know years. You don't need to know all that stuff. Just kind of give it a cursory review. Uh, the bottom half of the page, page 66, uh, we talk about uh, the fact that uh, the village and towns can work in conjunction uh, with, uh, with each other for special projects and that uh, the Board of Trustees governs a municipality instead of the city council in certain circumstances. So just kind of give that a read through on your own. Uh, at the bottom of 66, we get into the New York State Historic Preservation Office. And it turns out that the items in bold at the bottom of the page are very important. Like those are your trigger words for a question that refers to the New York State Historic Preservation um, Office. So please know that as you set up your flashcards. Top of 67, we talk about the fact that uh, there's registers. There's a state that they, this, uh, the historic, the historic preservation office has a register that they maintain of New York state historic uh, preservation uh, properties. There's a lot of properties. Like we are, we are Western New York and New York state in general is full of history. And know that if you have a buyer, so here's a whiff a moment. What's in it for me? Why do I care? If you sell a home that has historic uh, relevance, you just can't go and start putting siding up and painting it any old color that you want. Like all kinds of rules apply. Now that goes beyond the realm of what we can talk about in the course. You don't want to test it on all of that. But you want to make sure, because here's what happens. When, when, you, when you sit with a seller in order to list a property and it's a historic preservation type of property, they will tell you. And I want you to remember, again, one of those things you cannot unhear. I want you to know that you need to check with all the rules and regulations that apply and make sure that, uh, that you're following them 
and that you share that information with prospective buyers too. And then you're going to kind of become an expert. Like, shock, like don't be shocked, but you'll be an expert at this before you know it. And there's a whole set of rules, and um, it's it's good it's good to know if you run across it. But just know that it could happen, and if it does happen, you want to be familiar with that. You don't want to look like you don't want people to say, oh, you know. Susie, you never get a right answer from Susie. She's not sure. You know, you want you don't want you want to instill confidence as as a real estate professional. You really do because um, it's just it's it's just who wants to deal with someone who's mediocre and, and barely competent? It's, that's not that's not great. Uh, top of page sixty five, the top half of the page, we talk about a little bit more about building codes and building uh, departments. Please know what's in italicized bold print. New York State utilizes a statewide building code that applies to all construction when no local code exists. There are some rural communities where they don't have their own local code. The big thing with the state is that if, if you have, if the state has a law that covers something, anything at all, your municipality can be stricter but can't be lenient relative to that statewide law. So they can be stricter, but they can't be easier as far as the laws go with anything, anything at all. And we, that's what we talk about a little bit there. And um, next paragraph, talk about the fact that uh, building departments, we consider them like the gatekeepers of the community. You know, you, that's kind of why, you know, you want to make sure that someone doesn't do crazy stuff like, you know, get, get, get a mobile home or a trailer and attach it to their house. This has happened. I mean, when I've driven through, I hate to say, but Chautauqua County, some of the more rural communities, you know, if, if people get to do whatever they want, you know, you don't want your neighbor putting up some, you know, some handyman special addition to their property. And then like when people drive by and look at your house when it goes on the market someday and they see that, that's going to, it's going to turn them off from wanting to even look at your home, you know, and definitely going to reduce the value. Now, if you remember from what we covered the other day, that's called externalities, forces outside the property that can affect your property and value in a negative way. We call that externalities. Again, I'm trying to connect everything for you. There really is connections between the different topics we talk about. The bottom of 67, we talk about property insurance. And I regret to tell you, there's a number of items here that you need to know. Usually up to three questions you'll see. Two is the most common number of questions you'll see at the state level. Top of page 68, you want to know what a binder is. Temporary insurance contract which commits or binds the company that an insurance agent represents and can only be issued by duly authorized people. So a binder is kind of like your proof from the insurance company that you're insured. Okay? Our home inspector students, they have to get a binder and submit it to the state when they get their home inspection license to prove that they are insured, they need liability insurance. You don't need any kind of special insurance as a real estate agent, but as a real estate agent, you know, people will be talking to you about, oh, you know, can you recommend a place to get insurance at? You know, they may get that from their lawyer, but they may ask you as well. If you remember when we were talking about electrical, if a home has fuses, instead of circuit breakers. Or if a home has 60 amp service instead of 100 amp service. Usually with fuses, you have 60 amps. You could have fuses, but usually not too often. You can't get traditional insurance from a typical insurance company on a home that has 60 amps or fuses. It's, it's a much higher risk, and there's fewer companies that write those policies. But you can't get a mortgage on a house that doesn't have the insurance, fire insurance. So you're going to want, when you sit down with your broker to do your interview or at some point, you want to ask that question. If I get asked about a property that doesn't have circuit breakers and or fuses, and they say to me, where can I get insurance? Do you have a place that you can recommend? I, I would challenge you to ask your broker that. I like when you have a number of questions to ask the broker who's sponsoring you, because this way you can see how much they know. You don't want to work for someone that's kind of clueless and they're just 
well, they don't know. They don't know about stuff like that. You know, like you should know. When you're active. You know these things. Okay. okay. So you want to know the definition of a monoline policy? Liability insurance is a real common question on the state exam too. It's typically the answer. So okay, let's let's just say your brain completely shuts down when you look at an insurance question. Now, don't use this as a crutch, but it's a crutch. If you get a question about insurance and your brain shuts down, the answer is probably liability insurance. I would rather you actually know like what it means. If you get hurt at a property, liability insurance takes care of that. So liability insurance is typically the, question, the answer to questions you'll see on the state exam. But again, it's if you get, if someone trips and falls at a property, that's liability insurance. The other question that the state exam will ask quite a bit as long as we're talking about insurance is E and O. E and O is errors and omissions insurance. That's if you make a mistake in the practice of practicing your profession. So as a real estate agent, if you, if you screw up, errors and omissions takes care of that. Kind of like when a doctor does surgery and they leave the scalpel inside, errors and omissions is supposed to take care of that, okay? So you want to read through casualty insurance, know that definition. I'm going to tell you the ones that show up most often. Casualty insurance, dwelling policy, you should put in little stars next to these. Know what an endorsement is. Endorsement is a written document attached to an insurance policy that modifies the policy by changing the coverage. Now, I don't know if you're becoming an expert yet at making your trigger words for your flashcards. Before I tell you, you tell me, what do you think your trigger word is to know that the answer to this question is endorsement? What one word should be on your flashcard that would tell you, oh yeah, the answer is probably endorsement? I'll, I'll wait a moment and have you respond. Yes, that is exactly correct. Modifies. There's almost no other question you would get in real estate that involves, nope, not change to policy, modifies. Modifies is a key word to use when asking a question about an endorsement. As we go a little further, you want to know the definition of peril. Replacement cost basis, I would know that one. Stack is another one. That stack is usually a multiple choice throwaway option. An insurance term that refers to coverages that are added to each other, resulting in a coverage amount that far exceeds the value of the dwelling. That's it. You know, that's a short, short and sweet version of it. Uh, we don't see floats too much, so just give that a cursory review. Uh, at the bottom of 68 and the top of 69, we talk about property insurance. And, uh, you know, there is a, there's an acronym that you should, that if, you, that if you took the portion of the program where we talk about mortgages, finance, where we talk about PITI, P-I-T-I, Principal, Interest, Taxes, and Insurance. Every mortgage payment you have, okay, every mortgage payment you have has P-I, Principal and Interest. If you put less than 20% down, you've got to have your taxes held in escrow, which means the bank will make your real estate tax payments, and insurance. But lenders have gotten away from having insurance escrowed because what they do is that's another whole department that they got rid of by coming up with a new way to do it, which is in the fine print that you get when you get a loan, it says... If you don't provide a paid insurance policy, an annual insurance policy that covers the bank as the insured and that, that, all that stuff, um, if you don't provide that within 30 days of your payment being made, the bank has the right on your behalf to go get pay for a policy to meet this requirement. And you agree, as a term of getting this mortgage, you agree that you will pay whatever that is. And like once my insurance policy, my insurance person made a mistake and didn't get that to the bank and the same policy that I paid like six seven hundred dollars for was fifteen hundred over fifteen hundred dollars 
I just about had a heart attack when I saw that. That was more than double. And it was all worked out. But just so that that's the incentive for your and, – and this is here, another whiffle moment for you. This is something you're going to need to share with your property owners, uh, not your owners, but with, your, with the buyers after they get into the house. You let them know about this. You know, the more you tell them, the more they're going to appreciate these extra things you do. There's no law that says you have to do that. And if you if you watch the video that I uploaded or you attended when we talked about it, uh, it's like an idea to limit your liability. That's what's called an idea to limit your liability in real estate. That could be something that you put on that eight and a half by 14 sheet three point font that says all the things you want to know as a buyer of real estate in New York. All the things you want to know as a seller of real estate in New York. Everything really fits together. You have a question here. If you do too many claims on your home insurance policy, all the home insurance give you the boot? Uh, oh, okay. So, yeah, um, it kind of, I can't talk too much about that because it goes way beyond like uh, the curriculum. But insurance, I remember when I was a kid. People would talk about, oh, yeah, my roof is leaking. But that's okay because if it leaks enough and it ruins a kitchen, I'll get a new, new kitchen out of it. Swear to God. Swear to God people would say this. And I thought, as a kid, I thought to myself, wow, that's cool. You just, like, let your house fall apart and blame it on something. You get, a, you get, you get new stuff. It's like, wow, that's great. Well, the insurance companies must have picked up on that at some point And flash forward to the current day. And uh, no, no, insurance is not meant to be used unless it's a cataclysmic event, okay? Well, it still happens now. Well, not in my world it doesn't happen. Uh, I learned, I learned. I don't want to say I learned the hard way, but in, in my, I've owned a bunch of property at, at, uh, over the years and been educated by insurance professionals. And they, if you use insurance too much, Try it with car. Get get into a bunch of accidents, and you'll find out how hard it is to get insurance. I think they call it the risk pool, and um, it, it's like you you, you only want to make a claim if it's going to be really something substantial, like a like a fire, you know, um, like a fire. I got I got nothing more than a fire, you know. Win claim if a claim is going to be a couple thousand dollars. Um, I would still not put that through the insurance because they're going to insurance companies are really smart. It's a great concept insurance. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. So, um, anyway, so we got a little bit more to cover and then we'll be done with this. Please know the definition of captive agents. So exclusive agents also referred to as captive agents. It's a third paragraph of page 69. Want to know that? They represent only one company. So read through the rest. Um, you got in the middle of the page, you've got there a person jumping on a trampoline. You've got all kinds of scary dogs, Doberman Pinscher and Bulldogs or uh, whatever they're called. Um, these are all like when you fill out an insurance, like a form, when they do an interview with you, these are some of the questions that they ask. Sometimes you can't get insurance. If you say, yes, I have a trampoline in the backyard. And the funny thing is what people try to do, and even the insurance companies know this now, if you have a pit bull, but maybe it's like, remember Elizabeth Warren? She was like a little bit Indian, like 0.1%, and then the rest was whatever she was. Well, that's what you people try to do with their pit bull. They say that it's, but it's 1% French poodle, and the rest is a pit bull, Okay. So I know pit bulls are, people love their pit bulls. They're very, very sweet, but they get a really bad rap, okay? So um, hopefully it makes sense what I'm trying to say. And you know, you're, you know, I know you're a real estate agent to be, and I know you're the master of ceremonies, but you can't solve all the problems in the world. You really, really can't. Um, if you could, it'd be, you'd be a great agent if you could do that, but you do what you can do. Uh, the bottom of page 69, I regret to tell you, that the state will ask you about the DP1 and the DP2, make yourself a flashcard. You've got to know that. Page 70. There's a bunch on page 70 you need to know. The good news is there's only two pages left, and then we've covered everything that you need for this evening. So anyways, at the top of page 70, top of page 70, 
The special form DP3 offers open peril all risk coverage. That's not capitalized by accident. You want to know that. On dwellings and other structures unless the peril is specifically excluded. So please know that for test purposes. Uh, third paragraph. Again, you want to read everything, but I'm highlighting what we most often see. Okay. All three dwelling policy forms contain general exclusions, which apply to the policy as a whole. The exclusions are water damage from flooding, water backup through sewers and drains, groundwater seeping through basement walls, uh, ordinance or law. The insurer will not cover losses related from enforcement of any law or ordinance regulating the use, construction, repair, et cetera, of a property. A really good way to get in trouble with your insurance company is to do illegal modifications to the property. Like it's like um, when I told you insurance is a great business to be in if you're the insurance company, they actually pay people. If you have a big claim, they actually pay people to research and find out if the reason why the house burned down was because of a fire that originated in the basement and the basement was illegally finished. Guess what? Paragraph 17 of page four says that any illegal modification of the property, they don't have to cover you. You have a big problem. Your life has just changed dramatically. There's so many reasons why making illegal modifications to your property is not in your best interest or in your client's best interest. So again, I'm full of great news for you. You know, sorry about that. Um, in the box at the bottom half of page 70, we talk about the comparisons between homeowner policies and DP ones, twos, and threes. You wanna look at the comparisons. Most people get things confused here, I regret to tell you, but, uh, and there's no easy way to like, sometimes we get lucky, we have people in the class that have insurance background or whatever, and that's that. This is great, it'll help you with two or three questions. But um, we do break it down at the bottom of page 70. We tell you HO2 is a broad form policy. That's worth memorizing. Tenants, HO4. Condo, HO6. Condos show up quite a bit as a multiple choice option. Sometimes it's throwaway, sometimes it's not. Flood insurance, you probably know what a flood is. We do explain that to you, the detailed definition. Uh, flood insurance is typically purchased separately through the National Flood Insurance Program. They usually abbreviate that NFIP, National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, read the paragraph on your own. Nothing too exciting there. You don't have to know about the 60 days that's in the next paragraph under cancellations, deductibles, and blanket policies. You should know what deductibles are. That's at the bottom of the page. Deductibles control the cost of insurance. So the higher your deductible, the lower the cost, but that's more that comes out of your pocket. Page 72, and we just look at the first few paragraphs and then we continue on another evening with the rest of the um, chapter. So the New York Insurance Department requires that disclosure notices be sent to the insured if the policy contains a hurricane deductible. And of course, downstate New York, Hurricane, um, hurricane Sandy, I think was an issue. It was either Sandy or Andrew. I forget which. If you know, let me know. But uh, there was a hurricane that was a big deal in downstate New York that caused a lot of damage. So, uh, you know, it's, the hurricanes is not just a Florida or Virginia thing, okay? Uh, we talk about a blanket property insurance policy. So it provides a single amount of insurance that covers or may apply to different types of properties. Uh, sometimes if you work with an insurance person, uh, it was Sandy, okay, so... Uh, if you work with an insurance agent, they can sometimes come up with better ways for you to cover yourself. And blanket policies, uh, blanket policies are nice because it can save you money and give you a larger uh, amount of protection, you know, like a million dollar blanket policy. I know that I, I've got three properties that are that fall under a blanket policy and they have a rule where you have to live in one of them. And then they let you have like a blanket policy. And every insurance company is different. So it's really worth talking to an insurance person. Don't just do everything on your own, you know, um, like a lot of people are used to doing.
I do want to talk about umbrella policies in the fourth paragraph of page 72, umbrella policies. So they provide very high limits of liability and broad coverage and will pick up where the primary home or commercial policy leaves off. So your insurance company will let you know and your agent will let you know when and where you should use these things. Okay?